Hey gang, so you're probably watching this video because you're thinking about taking A+. Plus. So, just to give you a quick little overview, the 900 series, which is 901 and 902, retires on July 31st. But don't worry, if you've been studying for that, you can still take that exam. As long as you get certified before July 31st, you're good to go. We actually got a few courses over at itmagickey.com that'll help you get certified before that time. But anyway, that's not why you're here. The new version is 1001 and 1002, right? So you got 901, 902, and you got 1001 and 1002. The difference between the two is that, like I said, the 900 series expires on July 31st. You can either take that or you can take the new version. The new version has a more emphasis on cloud computing and virtualization. So that's one of the major differences between the two. Both of them still have two parts. Both of them still have the same score. So you need a 675 to pass the first part and a 700 to pass the second part. If you get both of those together, then you'll pass the A-plus certification. So after this quick little introduction I'm giving you guys, there's going to be a review of A-plus questions, right? So A-plus questions, stuff to look out for tips and tricks. Not tricks, but just some tips, all right? And other than that, I'll see you in class. Hey gang, let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into the test preparation. All right, so on the 1002 exam, you need to get a 700 out of 900. Every CompT exam, seven out of 900, shit, excuse me. <laughs> Every CompT test is out of a scale of 900, right? But on this test, you gotta have 700. Only test is not out of a scale of 900 is cash plus, which is pass or fail. All right, so on this exam, the type of things you're gonna see is gonna be multiple choice questions and performance-based questions. Performance-based questions are also known as simulations. So the simulations simulate uh, something that would be done in the real world. This is CompTIA's way of doing hands-on. So this may be um, setting up a network server, this may be entering commands, but instead of just doing Question and answer, you're going to actually, actually perform something. All right? So you're going to get a maximum of 90 questions, and you're going to get 90 minutes for those um, 90 questions. So that can kind of seem scary. Like, oh, man, 90 minutes, 90 questions. Most of my students only get 75 to 80 questions, and 90 minutes is more than enough time for most of them because by the time that you get into there, you should be proficient enough to once you read the question, you absorb the information, you should be able to answer it and within 15 to 20 seconds, okay? So if this test prep isn't um, enough for you, if you still don't feel um, quite sure enough, you can head over to itmagickey.com and enroll into one of our A-plus courses and we'll get you squared away. All right, so these are the domains that we need to focus on for this exam. And then like I said, remember 1001 and 1002 together make A-plus. If you're 1001 certified, you still got another step to uh, take. If you got 1002 before 1001, you still got another uh, step to take. Just remember, both of these exams together make A+. Plus. So first thing, operating systems, then security, then software troubleshooting, then operational procedures is what's going to make up this course. So right now, I'm actually going to show you a quick little video to show you what it's going to be like when you actually go inside of the testing center. Are you wondering what it's like to take a CompTIA exam? This video will show you the different exam features and types of exam questions. The first item you'll see, after the welcome screen, is the Candidate Agreement, also called the NDA. You're allowed up to 28 minutes to review this document. These first couple of screens also show you how much time you have to take the test and the score you need to pass. The following features are available to help you during the test. Navigation arrows allow you to move back and forth from question to question. The timer keeps track of time spent. A calculator is available too. Flag for review allows you to skip a question and come back to it later. Time permitting, any questions you flagged will be presented to you again. The review screen will be your final opportunity to review and make changes. Once you click End Review, you can't return to the question section. CompTIA certification exams are comprised of various question types. Type 1 – Multiple Choice Questions 
Type 2, multiple response questions. The exam software helps by giving a hint when you pick too many. Type 3, fill in the blank questions. You'll need to type your response. Be careful, capitalization may count. Type 4, drag and drop questions, as seen here. Type 5, questions with exhibits. Click the exhibit button to view. Some questions may display a graphic or video as an exhibit. You may pause video files as often as you like. Type 6, performance-based questions. Click simulate to begin. These questions simulate an environment or technology and will require you to perform specific tasks. Performance-based questions are based on multifaceted scenarios. If you feel unsure, you may click the reset button, but you will lose any prior work when you perform this action. The timer is hidden during these types of questions, but the clock is still ticking. Since the question is simulating a real environment, be aware you may not see any feedback that you completed the task. When you're confident in your answer, click Done. To see an example of a performance-based question, visit certification.comptia.org slash pbq. Before you click End Exam, you may be asked to complete a short survey. Afterward, you'll see your score. It's important to note CompTIA may add question types to its exams that you haven't seen in this video. Also, all translated exams provide the same functionality as English language exams. Clicking the Exhibit button on most translated exams will show test questions and options in English. The one exception may be performance-based questions. We hope this video helped you become more familiar with what to expect on a CompTIA certification exam. We wish you the best on your certification exam. All right, gang, we're back. Let's get straight into the question and answer portion, right? So this is going to get you kind of in the right mind frame to learn how to think critically and analyze things because on this exam, um, troubleshooting and critical thinking is going to be pivotal in your success. All right, so let's see how we do of the following, what would provide the best physical security for a server room? Best physical security. Easy. Biometric lock. Good job. Simple, simple, simple. So, cable locks. That doesn't make sense. VPN isn't physical. Privacy tent. That doesn't make sense either. All right. Next up, Ronald received an email requesting his username and password. The email looks to be from a legitimate source. But Ronald is unsure. What kind of email could this be? It's probably a phishing email. All right, so it's spelled a little bit different, but phishing um, is a type of attack where somebody can either call you on the phone or email you, and they'll ask probing questions to try and fish information out of you, okay? Next up, what's the most secure method of securing your smartphone? Most secure. What do we think? Out of these options, what is the most secure? Perfect. Fingerprint lock. Now, is this a fail safe? Is this um, impenetrable? No, because there's ways around fingerprint um, scanners as well. But out of those options, this would be the most secure. Okay? You're setting up a PC for a community space. The PC, the public PC, needs to be secure as possible. Of the following, what would assist you in doing so? What do we think? What would make this public PC more secure for all parties involved? Easy. So require authentication upon wake up. So what this means is you would set the um, computer or the device to go to sleep every 30 seconds of inactivity or a minute of inactivity. So if somebody gets up, somebody walks away, if somebody's not doing something and somebody tries to come and sit down, they will have to re-authenticate and enter the username and password or the passcode or however you got it set up. All right, gang, so what is PII? So PII stands for what? Easy. So PII is personal identifiable information. All right, so PI is personable, personal identifiable information. Once again, acronyms, right? Acronyms, acronyms, acronyms. Whenever you see an acronym, make sure you look it up so you know exactly what it is and what it pertains to, okay? 
An unattended install needs what to function properly? An unattended install needs what to function properly? So an install that you're not going to be around for needs what to function properly? Easy. The basketball player on the right is Allen Iverson, whose nickname was The Answer, and you need an answer file for unattended installation. So an answer file literally will just answer the things that come up during an install. Do you want to do this? Yes or no. Do you want to do this? Yes or no. It'll have an answer file, right? The stuff that you would normally click on and do, it'll answer those for you automatically, okay? Mikey is unable to view files on his company's work network from home. What's the first thing he should do? Easy. Check VPN settings. So a VPN is a virtual private network and allows you to get to something private from something public. So it means that you're at your public, or excuse me, you're at your, yeah, let's say you're at your home network, which is public, and then we want to get to something private, which would be his work network. And what happens is, is the VPN actually encrypts the traffic going from his home to his work network, giving it a secure connection. Next up, Mika has just removed the virus that was found on a company issued laptop. What should Mika require of the user before returning the laptop to him? All right, so found a virus on his laptop, removed it, and we're about to give it back to him. What should she recommend or what should happen before this guy gets his laptop back? Easy. Attend user training about what you should do, what you should not do, and have some kind of reprimands or some kind of corrective action in place that if somebody messes up, that they know what the consequences can be because this could have infected his entire network, okay? Of the options below, what would make a wireless network most secure? Choose two. Okay, perfect. Choose WPA2 as an encryption. What else? Great. Multi-factor authentication. What that means is that before you authenticate to a device or get on a network, you have to have more than one form of authentication. So you would need a username and password and a security badge. All right, so you need multiple factors to gain access to something, okay? Next up, Pixie booting is primarily used for PXC, also known as Pixie booting, is also is primarily used for what? So Pixie, another acronym, is short for pre-execution environment, pre-boot execution environment. So what do you need or what do you use Pixie booting for? Easy, perfect. Image deployment. So what happens with a Pixie booting, it automatically downloads an operating system or image to devices that you decide that you want to download that image to. So an image is just pretty much a copy of a device of the operating system of everything that's on it and you pretty much take that copy and you put that copy onto other devices. Pixie booting is primarily used to deploy images to devices on your network. All right, a user tries to download software that is unable to do so. What type of account do they have most likely? You guys know this one. Easy. Guest account. Can't do nothing but be a guest. Get on and get off. PII, which stands for Personal Identifiable Information. Uh, is considered government regulated data true or false? That is true. Of the following, which is the least technical method a malicious user can use to obtain user passwords? Least technical. Shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing, which literally means they just look over your damn shoulder and try and uh, figure out what your password is, what you're typing in. Shoulder surfing. Say that shit three times fast. All right, so. Uh, an example of single factor authentication, single factor, is username and password. True. So single factor, a username and password is something a user knows. Multiple um, factor authentication will have to be something the user knows and something the user has. All right, makes sense? So it has to be two different factors that um, allow somebody to be authenticated. All right, gang, so that was a quick test prep. Like I said, if that wasn't enough, 
take your ass over to itmasterkey.com and enroll in the course that's helping hundreds of students pass um, A plus as we speak right now where there's 900 of 1,000 series. So as a bonus tip, this is a couple things you need to look out for. When you're on the test, when it says choose all that apply, choose all that apply. If one applies, if two applies, if three applies, click all that apply. What's the next step? Looking at the scenario, looking at what the person has already done, what's the very next step that they should take? What's the first step? What's the first textbook step? The very first step. Is it power the machine off? Is it take off your jewelry? What's the next step? We already talked about that. Why the hell did I put that on here twice? Next up, what's the best option? Out of the scenario, out of the individuals that's in a scenario, what would be the best option for them? All right, gang, I know this makes you super sad, but our time has come to an end. If you need um, extra help, like I said, you can head over to itmagicky.com. We have a course that can get you together. Uh, make sure you follow us on all our social media platforms. But most importantly, down in the comments, tell me what um, certification are you going after and when you plan to actually get certified.